Our God in heaven, we thank you that we can um, connect. And help us to understand the things in history. So we understand what's happening in the present and the future. We ask that, um, I ask that you give me the words to speak and ease to hear. We thank you in your name, Jesus. Amen. So we've been walking through a timeline. And we've actually arrived at a, a pivotal moment in history for the LGBTQI community. with Evelyn Hooker. You know when you read about people and you wish you could meet them? She's definitely one of those people. I just want to talk about the line that we just walked through before. I know there was a lot of dates and information. And it was really a very scraping of the surface. But when you go deep into what happened to those people at those times, it gives you a really good perspective of how horrible it was for those people. So it's nice to have some good news now. That's what you want to call it. <laughs> but I'll, I'll say that it is a, a turning point in history. Now, another person, so um, Evelyn has a very um extensive so when you read about Evelyn's life it's very extensive so once again just a little snapshot of who she is So she was born in 1907 in Nebraska. So she was born to a very poor family. Her mother only had a third grade education. So her mother's words provided these excellent foundation for her life when she said, she would say often to Evelyn, she'd say, get an education because they can never take that from you. So she takes on her mother's very wise, wise words. And in 
1932, she's granted a PhD. I had to rub the board out because of room. But if we think in 1932, the depression is, uh, is quite bad. So there's not many positions for PhDs. But she's very fortunate and she gets a, a teaching job in a small women's college. In 1937, she receives an anonymous invitation to go to Europe for a year. And this purpose was to study psychotherapy. at the Institute of Psychotherapy in Berlin. Her interests have been increasingly turning to um, clinical psychology. This time that she's in Europe is so her experience overseas has um, planted a seed. That contributed to her wanting to help correct social injustice. So the terrible events that she witnessed outside that Berlin Institute were life-changing. While she was in Germany, she um, lived with a Jewish family. So she got a first-hand look at the rise of Adolf Hitler. And witnessed such events as the night of the broken glass. So she's seen these events through their eyes. Just to recap the Night of the Broken Glass. Mm -hmm. So on, on November the 9th, 1938, the Nazi leaders unleashed a series of attacks against the Jewish population in Germany. So shattered glass um, litters the streets. After Jewish owned businesses, synagogues and homes are vandalized. And that experience um, impacts her greatly. So after returning home, she's learned that the Jewish family she lived with
So all the members of the host family were killed in a concentration camp. So the Institute of Berlin was also overtaken by the Nazis. So what is this pivotal moment in history I'm talking about? For the homosexual community. So in 1945, Dr. Evelyn Hooker, she's a doctor, is a UCLA psychologist. For different reasons happening every time she went to get a job. Because she was a woman. They didn't want women in that workplace. So she was put in a university to teach night school. One of her very bright former students So his name's Sam from Sam. They spend a lot of time with Evelyn. Sorry, Sam and his male partner spend a lot of time with Evelyn outside going to dinner and out to restaurants. So she really gets to know them personally. And they approach her one day and they said, you need to study us normal homosexuals. And what he meant by was not damaged by treatment or in prison. but people who are in society. And he asked her because he wants to show the world what they are really like. This was to challenge a belief that gay people were by nature. Sorry. This was to challenge the belief that gay people were by nature mentally ill. So he wants to challenge this belief. <clears throat> so Dr. Hooker takes up the challenge. Um, the research, her research gets derailed until 1953. She actually secures an unlikely um, government grant. To pursue a study comparing 30 straight men and 30 gay men. So she gives these 60 men um, three different tests each, so three tests each. And then she asked some of the creators of those tests to pick out who was heterosexual and who was homosexual. And not one of the experts could distinguish who was straight and who was gay.
one of the experts, he said he, who was sure he could distinguish the group, asked for another chance to review. But he got the same result. So three years later, sorry, I pulled up. Um, Dr. Hooker presents her result studies. If we can remember the political and social climate, we have paranoia in America and so about communism and homosexuality. A threat to the country, security and to their children. So, so what a better time to undo these wrongs. So in 1956, she presents her results. At the APA Association, I'll start again, American Psychological Association. Another APA acronym. API. She rocks the profet sorry, she rocks the professions by demonstrating that gay men were just the same as straight men. Well, it will be another seventeen years. before the APA will remove homosexuality as a mental illness. So Dr. Hooker's study helped pave that way. Because it was the first time ever that there was solid scientific evidence. That heterosexuals and homosexuals were no different in mental health. So 1960s, mid mid 1960s to late 1960s there's a lot of social changes happening we already know the things that are happening from our movement that we talk about You have the civil rights and second wave feminism. There's also a lot of other things happening. You have a, a hippie uprising. Like an anti-war. an anti-establishment. 
um, sexual liberation. and uh, environmental awareness. And all this is happening in the Nixon era. So she's been asked, Evelyn Hooker, to write a paper on her findings. So they get buried because she's a woman. And the last thing the government needs is a gay movement to join to the civil rights movement. But in 1860, you have the gay and lesbian liberation movement begin. And they took knowledge of her research findings so they publish it. So 1968, the AEPA is still calling homosexual as a mental disorder. The 1969, We have the LGBT rights begin. With Stonewall. I actually want to jump back. It seems like a long way, but a hundred years before Stonewall. I found a little bit interesting. But back in, in 1865, there's a lawyer named Carl Urix. So he was saying even before the word homosexual was uh, existed, He argued that same-sex attractions were natural. And those who experience it should be treated the same as anybody else. So this is quite um, evolution, um, revolutionary back then. He became the first homosexual to speak out publicly in defence of homosexuality. So he stood before 500 um, lawyers and officials. So he argues the appeal of sodomy laws that criminalise sex between men. He concluded that love between two men was natural. And it's something they were born with. So he gets shut down. 
We also stir some people into support. Eric's lifetime, he refused to use that word homosexual. He re resented that sexual was part of the word at all. That this relationship be seen beyond sexual acts. So he has to flee Germany. He ends up in Italy. And he gives up his activism. So this fight for human rights has been on many lips. but has fallen on many deaf ears. So we're jumping back to 1960. In the next article, four. Talking about Dr Hooker. The 1960s saw her work find a wider audience and her conclusions were taken up by the gay, the gay rights movement. In 1961, Hooker was invited to lecture in Europe and in 1967, the director of the National Institute of Mental Health asked her produce a report on what the Institute should do about homosexual men. Richard Nixon's election in 1969 delayed the publication of the report, which was published by a magazine without authorisation in 1970. I think this report the report recommend recommended the decriminalization of homosexuality and the provision of similar rights to both homosexual and heterosexual people. So we come to 1973. And finally, the APA stopped calling homosexuality a mental illness. So the two people that we spoke about, Evelyn Hooker and Frank 
and Frank Kemi. Um, help contribute to this outcome. Read from Article 5. So Kami and Barbara Gintings So Barbara was American activist. She deserves her own stage. For what she achieved in giving a voice to lesbian civil rights. That's for another story. Continue on the article. Convince the American Psychiatric Association to hold a debate. So Barbara and Kemi have said, let's hold a debate. So the debate is psychiatry, friend or foe to the homosexual, a dialogue. at their annual meeting in Dallas. It was th for this debate that Dr. John Fryer, a gay psychiatrist in disguise as Dr. Henry Anon Anonymous, testified to how homosexuality being listed as a mental disease in the APA's Diagnostics and Statistical Manual of Mental disorders affected the lives of gays. So it affected the, the lives of gay psychiatrists and other homosexuals. Um, so Kami had approached numerous gay psychiatrists, but Fry was the only one who agreed to testify. And even he would only do so in disguise for fear of losing his position at Temple University, where he did not have tension. So the APA, the following year, the APA removed homosexual homosexuality from the DSM. And Kami described that day in December the fifth on December the fifteenth, nineteen seventy three, as the day we were all cured en masse by the psychiatrist. So finally, after all these years, somebody's listening. Because of Evelyn's paper, these change, sorry, these changes help to save a lot of gay men and women from mental health institutions.
and therapy like shock treatment. So quoting Evelyn Hooker later on in her life, When asked what moment stood out for her, so with tears streaming down her face, she says, I'm thinking of a woman, a young woman. Who came up to me in a meeting and said, when her parents found out that she was a lesbian, they put her in a psychiatric hospital and the treatment, sorry, and the standard procedure in that hospital was electric shock. But her psychiatrist was familiar with my work, she says. And he was able to keep them from giving it to her. So the young woman said that she'd saved her life. So we've talked about what's happening in the medical and the political realms. Now we just want to touch on religion. So I'm just going to write it here because I've rubbed out the other line. So in 1946, what happens there is a new translation of a Bible. So this is the 1946 RSV. There's much controversy around this Bible. We're just looking at homosexuality. So I'll just remind us because the board's rubbed out of what happened around the 1946 time period. So medically, they're saying that you're mentally ill. Homosexual, a homosexual, it became a crime. So all that caused mass discrimination. And that... Like we've said, there was no substantial control studies to say that any of this was true. So so the language is um, commonly used now. So the 1946 RSV Bible you can see that down there. One of the verses we're just going to have we're not going to look at it but just to give you um, the Bible verse. It's first Corinthians 6 9 through to 10.
So for the first time in any language, in any Bible, homosexual appears in the Bible. In no other Bible had that word appeared before 1946. It actually gets corrected in 1971. So 1946, it's homosexuality. In 1971, it's sexual pervert. So for 25 years, this word has been used until it was corrected. But the damage was already done. Now, this is a whole study in of itself that I'm not going into. That can be for another time. So this community has been misdiagnosed, misunderstood and mistreated. Now, a mistranslation of the scriptures is laid on top. So everywhere this community turns, in society, it seems people want to cast them out. like we've seen in the medical, political government. The workplace and families. And now you are told that even God doesn't love you. So for a long time, it wasn't a, a church issue so much. Remember, homosexuality was seen as a mental disorder and a crime. So the, medical, the science and medical world are trying to fix it. So the churches aren't dealing with it. They're advised if a homosexual comes to their church. So they were directed, they would be told to direct them to a professional because it was a mental illness. So after this translation, this translation, homosexuality is a sin in the Bible. And if it's now a church moral issue, then the church needs to deal with it. The medical world is saying it's not a mental illness anymore. But now it's all overshadowed.
people are told in their Bibles that homosexual person cannot enter the kingdom. Call your So when you think there's just like a little bit of hope for these people, it doesn't stop, it just changes form. So the discrimination continues. I know we're skipping a lot of history, but we're at 1980. We have the AIDS crisis. So in 1980, I'll start again, sorry. In, 19, in 1980, only four cases were diagnosed. By 1986, by the time the president says the word HIV, 20,000 Americans have died. And 36,000 have HIV. We see an uprising of the religious right. And that's another whole study of its own. So the evangelical Protestants. <coughs> we you know beginning with Billy Graham. Politically, they're trying to push people from the uh, from the left to the right. <clears throat> Political, politically. We have Jerry Farwell and the Moral Majority. <clears throat> which for this movement made us go from right to left. So the evangelical Protestants, the religious right, so they have literally take it all back to around the 1950s So I should have explained a bit more. So they take um, discrimination of homosexuals back into the 1950 mindset. Because it's a moral issue now and only the church can fix it. So we see a huge regression of the community. Because of the religious right. <clears throat> I've just got some closing thoughts. We've seen a tiny part of history. Um, how the LGBTQ community were misdiagnosed, misunderstood and mistreated. We saw some turning points.
with the three people that we mentioned because of their love of humanity. So they help take down the misunderstandings and misdiagnosis. of homosexuality as a mental disorder. Cami helps take down sodomy laws. He actually personally drafts a bill that finally passed in 1993. So we can cross out crime. For a long time, sorry, for a long time, people have been fighting this misunderstanding of sodomy. From lawyers to journalists to astronomers. The whole construct of sodomy has been flipped on its head through time. So the word sodomy has changed its meaning over time. But we know the original meaning it's about abuse and control over another person. So power over someone. The strong over the weak. We know the story of Lot, the sin of Sodom. It was about abuse, sexual violence, terrorism. So the sin of Sodom can never be labelled onto a person. Who chooses to be in an equal loving relationship. We've gone through scriptural texts with elder tests. That have been weaponized against the LGBT community. And this is because of wrong methodology. The disease of literal to literal interpretation. <clears throat> Proof texting with no historical context. So our prophetic methodology has pulled down the, these misinterpretations of those texts. And have brought light into a darkened understanding. This movement has taken down. That homosexuality is a sin.
if I could strip all this back, and look at the core reason why these homosexual men were discriminated against. It's a basic concept. It's because these men were not seen, seen to be acting like real men. They were seen as defective. Broken and weak. So what are all those words associated with? It's with being female. And when we live in a patriarchal world, what don't you want to be associated with? That's being female. When we see that whole focus has been on homosexual men, We can also see highlight, highlighted the hatred of women. This movement has been taught through the prophetic understandings The importance of gender equality. The discrimination and abuse that this community has been through. And is still going through. because of gender stereotypes. Society has said what is normal for a man and a woman. So everything outside that model is considered abnormal. Sick and broken, and need of fixing. So, society's expect expectations of how a male and female should look. How they should dress and behave. how they conduct themselves. And who should they and who they should love. All these events that we've talked about are a thread of a patriarchal culture. that's been driving our world for thousands of years. And still drives our world today. So we don't know what makes people fall in love. But we know that the LGBTQI plus community have that equal white, equal white to
So the equal right to have a loving, equal relationship with whoever they choose. And we, and we are in full support. And we know God is too. So we know our test is about gender equality. But we also know that it's gender because of marriage. The twin institutions of Eden is Sabbath and marriage. And to rightly understand marriage. So we know our Sunday law test is not because we keep the Sabbath. And others keep Sunday. But because of where we stand on gender, in opposition to evangelical Protestants, And where Adventism stand on issues of gender. In union with evangelical Protestants. So we know unfortunately Adventism as an institution will stand with Protestantism. and give, ho give homage to the papacy. So there's more to say on these issues of gender. And about challenging the gender stereotypes. I encourage you to um, have your own personal study into these things. There's much to learn. I'll just ask if you, we could pray to finish. Our God in heaven. We thank you for this movement, this radical feminist movement, they're not afraid to challenge the gender stereotypes, and call out when there's discrimination. My hope and pray, prayer is that we would not take these things lightly, but see how deep patriarchy is in all aspects of our lives. We thank you that you love us. And as we share that love to one another, we look forward to your soon coming. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen.
I just want to say a, a really big thank you for everybody that has come today. The, pe the people that are here and the people that are online. And look forward to seeing you all again soon.